So we are back in the book of Haggai. We are finishing up. Uh, last week, uh, we got to the end, and Brian Hillard, our youth pastor, looked at me and said, uh, there were only two verses left. What in the world are you going to do next week? Like, we were, we were at the finish line. Why didn't you just finish? And I said, well, because the last three verses are really incredible, and I wanted to take some time to unpack the last three book, verses of the, the book of Haggai. So we're in Haggai chapter 2. There's only two chapters. And we're in 20 through 23. If you're online, you can go to our service page. You can click the links and it'll have all the scriptures there that we're going to go through because there's a lot today. Because the last three verses of Haggai give some incredible promises from before in the covenants of God and what's coming in the covenants of God. And that's what we want to look at uh, this morning. Now, if you remember in the book of Haggai, our theme for the series has been uh, rebuilt. It's the idea that God is calling his people. If you remember where we're at in this story, God's people have been defeated through their own stupidity. God told them, if you didn't obey me, if you didn't follow me, then I was going to take my hand off and let the nations bring discipline on you. And that's exactly what happened. They had been in captivity for 70 years. They've been slaves for 70 years. Now they have been sent back to the land because Persia overthrew Babylon because Babylon disobeyed God. And didn't treat God's people well. And God said, if you don't treat my people well, specifically he told King Nebuchadnezzar, I'll overthrow you. And that's exactly what happened. And Persia came in. And now this king, Cyrus, has given an edict that the Israelites can return back and rebuild their land. And God has told them to go back. And the first thing they're to rebuild is the temple. They go back. They begin to rebuild. It gets hard. They get discouraged. And God sends Haggai to encourage them. And this is probably about a decade, 15 years later, after they had returned. They just kind of gave up and said, ah, we just do what we can. YOLO, you only live once, we'll just do the best we can with our life, and whatever happens, happens. We're just glad to be back in the land, glad to live. That was their attitude. And so Haggai comes in, and he's telling the people, hey, God has a plan for you. He's asking you to rebuild the worship center of your life. In the New Testament, God says that that worship center is no longer a physical temple, but the heart. And he says, I want you to rebuild the heart of my city, Jerusalem, the temple. I want you to rebuild your hearts. And so they begin the work again. They repent. One of the few prophets that actually they listen to. God's people listen to and repent. They start to rebuild. And then Haggai has a few more words to encourage and then tell, what, tell the people, specifically the priests and the king, what's getting ready to happen someday. And it's really really cool. And today, we're going to look at what God says to the king, Zerubbabel, because he says, Zerubbabel, I will take you, and I will make you. And you see, that's exactly what God offers humanity. He says, I'll take you, all your sin, all your mess, I'll take you, and once I do and you surrender to me, I will begin the process of rebuilding, remaking you into something and someone that you could that will be unrecognizable to the world around you and to even yourself if you'll let me. But the problem is, like the people in Haggai's day, we don't do that. We try to make what we want. We don't do and make what God wants. We don't simply take one stone and place it one at a time. We just look and say, it's nothing, it doesn't matter, and we get discouraged just like the people of his day. And when you realize, when you finally come to the place in your life, when you realize that no one else wanted you, And God said, I'll take you. When you finally come to that place, it's a beautiful place. When I finally came to the place in my life where I realized that God loved me, that he cared for me, that that the love of the people around me, even my parents who were loving to me, paled in comparison to the love of God. And that, that I couldn't make relationships work. God had to do it. When I finally came to that place, I began a journey that I'm so glad God did and continues to do in my life. You see, we love makeovers, right? Love to watch the makeover shows, whether it's a house or body image, and they take something that looks terrible maybe and is broken down or whatever, and and they remake it. They, They redo it, and they show you the pictures. It's like, wow, that's incredible. What we don't like is the bulldozer that just bulldozes and builds something new that doesn't even look anything like it. We're like, well, that was so unfortunate, right? Why did they just get rid of that? Why did they? That's awful. 
You see, God is in the business right now of rebuilding. Someday he's going to bulldoze it all. He's going to bulldoze it all and start over. But not right now. And he's calling you and he's telling you that he wants to take you and he wants to make you into his. You see, there's no greater act of service, and I would even say worship in our culture, than to give yourself fully to another person and to have them take you. And there is nothing worse than that being taken back or taken for granted and that being given to someone else. It's life shattering. And God says, I will take you and I will never let you go. And when you mess up, I'll take you again. Because that's exactly what he's doing with his people. They keep messing up and he keeps saying, I'll take you back. I'll take you back. I love you. I'll forgive you. I'll, I'll find a way. I'll, I'll, find, I'll remake you. Let me, like, that's the, the whole book of the Bible. <laughs> There's no other God that does that. The other gods just say, I'm going to wipe you out and I don't care. You obey me or else. God says, no, I, I, want, I want to have a relationship with you. And God even gave his one and only son. He, he left heaven. He took, took on. He took bodily form so that God could make him our sacrifice. He could die in our place for what we deserve, the selfishness and the things that we've done. And God said, I took my son so that you could be made like him. And God allowed him to be crucified and die physically, but then he was remade alive again. <laughs> Like, this is the story of our book, and as Haggai wraps up, this is what we see. Last couple of weeks that we've gone through this book, Haggai 1 says, The Lord of hosts says, These people, the time has not come for the house, or these people say the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? In other words, you're focused on what you want to make and what you want to do. You're taking what you can take instead of Asking God what he wants. And then he says, now the Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the Lord's declaration, the Lord of hosts. Because my house still lies in ru ruins while each of you is busy with his own house. You're so busy with trying to make a life for yourself and trying to take whatever you can get to make it that you don't pause to look at everything I offer you and the life eternally I'm going to make for you and make that your focus. And then we ask, we look, it says, is, is it really time for me to be remade? We doubt that. God couldn't love me. God couldn't care about me. No, he wants to remake us. You know, and God wants us to see how much he values life. You see, we don't think about our ways too often because it's depressing. <laughs> If you read the Bible and think about the ways of God's people, it's kind of sad. <laughs> it's really sad. You read the New Testament, and, and that kind of is encouraging, a little more encouraging. You read the Old Testament, you're like, oh my goodness, these people are idiots. And then it's like God asks you to raise your hand. Yeah, you too, me. You know, like Blake Shelton on the voice where he's like, right here, that's me, I'm just like them, right? Like I point to myself. That's, that's exactly the same thing. And God says, think about your ways. Think if I don't want to take you and make you. That's what I have been offering my people forever. Is I gave, like first thing, Adam and Eve gave them a garden. I'm going to take dust and I'm going to make you. And then they sin and he says, okay, I can't let you live in sin forever. So now there's a death on you. Now will you let me take you and make you? Like this, this is the story of our scripture. And so will we think about our ways? Second thing, and how he wants to take us and make us. In Haggai 2, it says, who left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? Even so, be strong. Be strong, be strong. Three times. <laughs> Work, for I am with you. In other words, God says, I want to be with you. I want you to know that you're with me, but there's work to do. You live in a world that the Bible says produces thorns and thistles for our work, that we know that we're not going to be fully remade until we get to heaven someday. And I offer myself and I take and say, God, I'm yours to make whatever you want. And then he says, this is the promise I made with you when you came out of Egypt, when I delivered you, when I took you out of slavery... You were nothing to the Egyptians, the most powerful empire on the planet, nothing to them, but I took you to show them that I was something and that I loved you 
And my spirit I put among you, I I put my spirit there to make you my people, so don't be afraid. And the final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of hosts. I will provide peace in this place. This is the Lord, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. And we know that that hasn't happened yet. There's been a few times in history where Israel and Jerusalem have been at peace and things have happened, but the full peace that God's talking about hasn't happened yet. And we'll look at that at the end of the message today. You see, God doesn't even try to convince them that what they're seeing is great. (laughs) He's like, nope, it's nothing (laughs) compared to what it could have been had you all not done what you've done. But you know what? I can still remake it into something. And it's not fully what it should be, but someday it will. Now, will you participate with me in that? It's like when you watch the home makeover shows. Do you realize that when they did the extreme home makeover show, in the beginning when they started to do that show, they would give people these homes, right? Right? With the homes came debt. And people were struggling because, yeah, they have this big fancy home, but their tax bills went through the roof. And there's all these things, and they can't afford to live in the makeover. And so they thought, oh, we need to be sure we're paying for people. Like, they don't have any response. Like, if we're going to give them this house and it's going to be a blessing, there can't be debt with it. That's exactly what God says. He says, I want to forgive you. I want to wipe out the debt so there's no debt you have to repay back to me. You're free. And you're free to declare to others. When people walk up to the house, you don't go, I did this. Look at how awesome I am. I rebuilt this whole thing. No, you didn't. I saw the show. Ty was there. You remember Ty? Ty was the extreme home makeover guy. He's the one that rebuilt this. He got all the contractors to come. You kind of, you went on vacation. They sent you and your family to Disney World. You pulled up in a limo and there's your house. You did nothing but say, have it. I surrender what's mine. I surrender my belongings. I surrender the property. I surrender the contents to you. Do what you want. I trust you. Hello, that's the gospel. And that's exactly what he says. He goes, it may seem like nothing. And you know what? That house that they got, it's going to get old. In about 25 years, it's going to need a new roof. It's going to need paint. The floors are going to have to be redone. And you'll be going, ah. Oh. And it's a bigger house than you had before, so it's going to be a lot harder to get it all done. And you know what? Extreme home makeover isn't coming back for a second time. <laughs> but God keeps coming back over and over again. And so he looks and he says, think about your ways. And when you think about your ways, it's going to seem like nothing. But I'm telling you, I'm doing something. Trust me, work, be strong. That's what he says. Then he goes on and he says, Now reflect back from this day. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple, what state were you in? I love this because when it seems like nothing, God says, Think back at what state your old house used to be. What state you used to be in. The thoughts that you used to have that you didn't even struggle with having. And now it's a fight in your mind and in your heart. Think, think back. And then he says, I struck you, all the work of your hands, with blight, mildew, and hail, but you didn't turn to me. This is the Lord's declaration. But from this day on, I'll bless you. It's not what they do. It's just who God is. <laughs> I want to bless. I'm looking for people to bless. I'm looking for people that will be a part of what I'm doing And he looks at the spiritual leaders and he says, cause my people to reflect back. You reflect back. Think about the fact that you're not a person of your own making. We live in a culture that's a victim-blaming, excuse-making, woe-is-me culture. And God says, no, reflect back. You deserve worse than this. And I'll take whatever, I'll take the surrender and I'll turn it into something. But you've got to participate with me. You've got to surrender to me. This is the beauty of of the gospel, and we looked at how he would bless, which is Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. And it's easy to say, yeah, God, I want to remake you. And then he starts giving us the blessings listed in Matthew chapter 5, and the Beatitudes are like, I don't want this anymore. I don't like my new house. I don't like the extreme home makeover. Let's do, I want to go back. Because I don't know about you, but I visited someone's house this week, and they have four bathrooms. You know the first thing that popped into my head, and I even said out loud when they said I have four bathrooms? I got to clean four bathrooms? I just take one. One and a potty. That's all I need. I just need one and a potty. You know, you got to, you don't want to, if you got to go, you don't want to have to wait for the person. So you got one and a half bath. That's good for me. Maybe two and a half. So if one bathroom goes down, you got another one. 
See, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, the work. And that's exactly what God says. As I bless you, it's going to require you to surrender more of yourself to me because I want people to see the glory, the blessing that I have. So then we pick up the story again in Haggai 2, and it says, the word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the same day, the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and destroy the powers of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overturn chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will fall, each by his brother's sword. You see, is this really the word of the Lord? You keep seeing in this book, and you see it in other places, where it says the word of the Lord, or the declaration of the Lord. Did God really say that was the original sin to Satan, to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? He looked at them and he said, did God really say? And Adam and Eve went, well, I don't know. Maybe he did it. And they didn't go ask him. I mean, that would be the smart thing to do, right? Hey, did, did that person really say that? I don't know. Hold on. Let me go ask. Did you really say this? No. No, they didn't say that. No, that's not what they did. They immediately said, well, I don't know if he said that. Now, what do I want him to say? Well, I, want him, I would want him to say this, so I think that's what he said. And that's what we do. We try to make what we want instead of saying, God, what do you want? And God said there is a day coming. He says, speak to the king, Zerubbabel, the king, the governor of Judah. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And then when things get shaken up, we get surprised. I am amazed at the Christians who are shocked by where our culture is today. I'm like, you're shocked? Why? Like, God tells us this is where you're going to go. Have you ever read Romans 1? Like, we just did Romans last fall. Like, God, God has told us clearly that this is where we would end up. I don't know if you know that. He's told us clearly that... We're not going to create like a promised land utopia and then he's going to come back and take those people out. No, 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 no. He says that we're going to be scattered among the people. He says that it's going to be bad. He's laid that out and he says, I'm going to, not I might if you're good enough. He says, no, I'm going to remake the world. I'm going to remake authority. I'm going to remake it all. And he says, I will take them, these nations that are taking life from me, that are existing because I allow it, and I'm going to shake things up. You see, tune in for a sec. For God to say this to Zerubbabel would have shaken him at his heart's core because these words were spoken to his grandfather, only in a very different context. We'll see in a moment. You see, Zerubbabel would have been, this would have been very personal and incredibly scary to have God say this to him. And it would have been very full of grace and mercy to have God say this to him. You see, Zerubbabel's name means sown in Babylon and scattered. That's what his name means. That's what the name Zerubbabel means. You're born a slave and scattered. Like, so to to see something being shaken up and scattered again, you're like, I don't, that's who I am. I don't want that anymore. I want to be remade into something different. And God's like, I'm going to. Look at Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah is the prophet that prophesied that they would spend 70 years in captivity if they wouldn't repent. At the time, Zerubbabel's grandfather was the king of Judah who would not listen. And Jeremiah says this, this is what the Lord says, go down to the, pla- to the palace of the king of Judah, his paneled house, and announce this word there. You are to say, hear the word of the Lord, king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you, your officers, and your people who enter these gates. Go to verse 4. For if you conscientiously carry out this word, then kings sitting on David's throne will enter through the gates of this place Riding chariots and horses, they, their officers, and their people. He just said he's going to shake up the chariots and horses. And Zerubbabel had to remember, had to think back and say, I remember when my people were offered to ride chariots 
and they didn't listen. They didn't want to be remade. They liked what they had made in southern Judah. They liked the life they had for themselves. They liked their idols that went along with God. God was just another one of their pet idols like all the rest. See, most Christians treat God more like a pet than they do an authority. If I feed him, then he'll be nice to me. He won't bite me. When I come home, he's ready to pet and just, how you doing? It's so good to see you. I mean, it's maybe a cat. Maybe he's more like a cat and he's just got a little bit of attitude and you like that, right? Cat's like rubs up against you and like, I'm here. Hi. You know? But we, if we're honest, we don't treat God like it's his house. We treat him like we have him in our house. He's a pet for us. And, and, and that's exactly what God's people were doing when Zerubbabel's grandfather was king. And so because they didn't do this, fast forward. Verse 5 says, but if you do not obey these words, then I swear by myself, this is the Lord's declaration that this house will become a ruin. Verse 8, many nations will pass by this city and ask one another, why did the Lord do such a thing to this great city? They will answer, because the people, they, abandoned the covenant of Yahweh their God and worshiped and served other gods. They didn't allow God to take them and they didn't want to be remade into God's image. And so God had no other option but to say, if you're gonna represent me, I, I cannot let you, rep I would rather you represent me broken with nothing than represent me acting like you have everything but it's all on you. And that's exactly what he does. And then, check this out, in Haggai 2, it goes on to say, in verse 23, on that day, on that day, whenever you see that in the scripture, it typically is referring to end times. It's referring to like the end of days. So on that day, on the final day, on the final moment when God will shake the heavens and the earth and he will overthrow the nations, this is talking about future, end time stuff with Zerubbabel. He's trying to give Zerubbabel a picture that there is a purpose for your life. You're not going to probably see it, but if you'll just place one stone, one thing, one on the net, I have a plan for you. Just trust me, is what he's trying to get Zerubbabel to see. It's the same thing he tries to get us to see. And then he says, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shelatel. You have to remember, we'll see in just a second in Jeremiah, he told his grandfather, I'm done with you. And now he's looking at Zerubbabel and saying, I want you. I'll take you. I love you. And then he says, and make you. He says, and then he says, oh, say, my servant. That's also, that word my servant is also a, a word that is used for the Messiah in the Old Testament. Like the servant, the one that will come, the Messiah. And so he's looking and he's prophesying and he's saying, Zerubbabel, you're from the throne and line of David. And through the throne and line of David, I am going to bring my servant, not the servant of you all, not your pet servant. No, 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 no. I'm going to bring my servant that will do my will, who is from the line of David, who will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what he's telling Zerubbabel right here. And he says, this is the Lord's declaration forever. And he says, and make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. A signet ring was what kings used to sign or to seal documents. It was the official ring. When you had the signet ring, it meant that the decree that was given was carried out or you were dead. That's what it meant. In the Old Testament, Queen Jezebel took Ahab's signet ring and made evil of the nation. And Ahab was just fine to give his little ring away to, to Jezebel so she could wreck things. The signet ring signifies authority. It signifies law. It signifies control. And he says, I'm going to give you my signet ring. This is a guy that was born in slavery, grew up in slavery, is figuring out how do I rule people? I don't know. I've been a slave. I'm trying, look, I've been doing a terrible job. I brought everybody back here. I was put in charge by Cyrus. Didn't even ask to do that because I'm from the line of David and God knew it. I had to come back here to Jerusalem to build this city and I don't have a clue what I'm doing and I proved it because Haggai got to come back a decade later and tell me you don't know what you're doing I don't know if I want the signet ring <laughs> somebody else can have it <laughs> I'm an idiot <laughs> God's like this isn't about you this is about me and you and a relationship and if you have me then you have my authority 
And with that comes responsibility that's glorious and wonderful to tell the world about me. And then he says, look at this. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Remember, he said, I'm going to shake things up. The nations are going to fall because I am the Lord that commands the real armies of heaven. Do you realize God doesn't even have to bring angels to destroy us? He just has to, look at this, he just has to flick one large asteroid out of the asteroid belt in the Milky Way, beep, like a pebble, and it hits us, and we're all done. That's how fragile we are. And we think we're so important. And we are so small things, and yet God says, you are important to me. See, our tree, our culture is, just does not get this. Sometimes we can look and say, well, seriously, what does it matter if I have a signet ring in a temple if it doesn't benefit me, if things aren't going well, if it's all just going to be destroyed again? It's pointless. And in the midst of the mess that Zerubbabel's still in because the temple still isn't rebuilt, he's got rubble all around him. The walls of the city are torn down. He's living in a mess. And he looks at him and he says, you're my signet ring, I'm with you. And he's got to look around and go, really? Really? You're with us? Are you sure? Because I don't see it. Or he says, even though there's a mess, even though we don't have walls to protect ourselves, we don't have gates to keep the enemies out, I believe that you'll keep us, that you'll do what you said you would do, and so let's get together and let's put another stone in the wall. Let's put another stone in the wall. Let's do one more thing God asks us to do. One more, one more, one more, as long as it takes. And Zerubbabel has to remember, because my grandfather wouldn't do that. Look at what Jeremiah says. 23 says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. This is the Lord's declaration. I will raise up shepherds over them. Who will shepherd them? They will no longer be afraid or dismayed, nor will any be missing. This is the Lord's declaration. The days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will raise up a righteous branch of David. He will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. This was written... 90 years before what we're reading about Zerubbabel. God is saying, I'm going to send you away. It's going to be hard. You're going to go through a hard time. You may not even see any of this happen, but will you trust me to go build what I tell you to build in Babylon, trusting that you're going to raise up another generation that will come back, i.e. Zerubbabel? Are you willing to live that life? Are you willing to believe that I'm going to bring a righteous branch? Because you have to remember, Zerubbabel's not from a righteous branch. Zerubbabel's from the unrighteous father that wouldn't listen to God. It goes on and says this, In his days Judah will be saved and Israel dwells securely. This is what he will be named, Yahweh our righteousness. Yahweh the one that saves us. That's Jesus who will make things right. The days are coming. Again, that's end times. The Lord declares when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites from the land of Egypt, but it will be said, as the Lord lives who brought and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the land of the north and from all the other countries where I had banished them, they will dwell once more in their land. That is a prophecy about Jesus, that he will go to the ends of the earth to call people to be his sheep of his pasture to... That's, that is what this means, and it was written thousands of years before today and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus' time. Haggai 2 goes on to say, on that day, this is, the Lord's dec- this, this is the declaration of the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shelatel, my servant, this is the Lord's declaration, and make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. So if this is what God says, then then where does all this mess keep coming from? Can, can, Can we back the truck up for just a minute to see how amazing it is of what God will take and what he will make? Do you realize that God asked his people desperately? He looked at them and in almost, when you read, God is never desperate, but when you read it, it's almost like a desperate plea. He looks at them and says, please do not ask for a king. All the other nations want a leader that will be their king and will deliver them. I want you to trust me to be your king. Please don't ask for a king. And the people said, we want a king. And he said, if you get a king, it's not going to go well. 
He's going to rule you. It's going to be bad. That's okay. We want a king because everybody else has a king. Fine, pick a king. They picked Saul. That went very badly. However, Saul still reigned for 40 years. I heard that on the radio this week. I was driving, I was listening to a message, and, the, and I, don't, I have no idea what the sermon was about. All I remember is he said, and Saul reigned 40 years. And I went, Saul reigned 40 years? I'm 46, almost 46. Like, that'd be my whole lifetime. Like, he's six years old, he comes on the throne, I got this terrible, wicked leader my whole life. Like, literally. I didn't realize he reigned that long. And David was called to be the other king in the Old Testament. David was anointed to be a king in place of Saul. Jonathan, Saul's son, said, I believe David's supposed to be king. Not you, dad, but I'll still serve you. And Jonathan ends up dying under the wickedness of his father. Like, this is our Bible. This is our story. Do you realize that God never wanted a temple? Never wanted a temple. Look at 2 Samuel. Look at this. 2 Samuel 7, when the king had settled into his palace, that's King David, okay, the anointed king. Remember, God didn't want a king, but he still took a king, and he made David who he wanted him to be. God took a temple, and he said, if you're going to have a temple, I'm going to make it what I want to be. You don't get to make anything. You don't get to control everything. It's all under my control. See, that's what God does. That's the beauty of us following him, is we can mess up, and God can turn it around. It's amazing. And it says, the Lord had given him rest on every side from his enemies, David. King David said to Nathan the prophet, look, I'm living in a cedar house while the ark of God sits, in, sits inside tent curtains. Remember the tabernacle? It was a tent. David's living in his paneled house and God lives in a tent. David never asked the question, does God want me to live in a paneled house? Oh, no, no, no. That, that didn't even cross his mind to think, Maybe God wants me to live in a tent too since I'm the king and I should model that to people. Oh, no, 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 no. God needs a bigger house than me so I can justify my house. Look what happens. So Nathan told the king, go and do all that is in your heart for the Lord is with you. Nathan doesn't even pray to God. He's supposed to be the prophet protecting the nation. He doesn't even pray to God. He's like, oh, David, you're good. God's provided so much peace. He's anointed you. You're awesome. Just do what you want. Fast forward, verse 4. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. In other words, that wasn't the word of the Lord, Nathan. Go to my servant David and say, this is what the Lord says. Are you to build a house for me to live in? Is that what I've asked you to do? From the time I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until today, I have not lived in a house. Instead, I have been moving around with a tent as my dwelling. In all my journeys with all the Israelites, have I ever asked anyone among the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? Now, this is what you are to say to my servant David, Nathan. This is what the Lord of hosts says, Lord of armies, who lives in a tent with no fortress, no walls. This is what... I took you from the pasture, David, and from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. I will make a name for you like that of the greatest in the land. I will establish a place for my people, Israel, and plant them so they may live there and not be disturbed again. Evil doers will not afflict them as they have done ever since the day I ordered judges to be over my people, Israel. I will give you rest from your enemies. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. Who's going to make a house? David? Solomon? God says, you trust me to make what I want to make. You surrender to me. Quit trying to build stuff for me in your own strength and just trust me and do what I asked you to do. Now, it's amazing that he's asking Zerubbabel to rebuild a temple that he never wanted in the first place. Why? Because it's an object lesson, <laughs> right? He's trying to show them, yeah, you're going to build this temple and you're going to be done with it. Look at it and go, this seems like nothing. Yep, I know, because it's just a building. He goes on and says this, so he answered me. This is the word of the Lord. In Zechariah 4, this is what God went on to say. Zechariah was another prophet that prophesied. And he said, so he answered me. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zechariah is speaking to Zerubbabel, and this is what he says. 
Not by strength or might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of his armies. What are you, great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. And he will bring out the capstone accompanied by shouts of grace. Grace to it. Zechariah is prophesying that Zerubbabel is going to bring the cornerstone. Jesus is called the cornerstone. And the nation is going to pause and look at that stone that's being placed and say, that's the grace of God. The grace of God. The grace of God. We didn't bring that cornerstone in. We didn't deliver ourselves from slavery. We didn't do this. God did. And our response will be to build from that stone. Our response will be to build what God asked from what he laid. That's exactly the gospel. And Zechariah is saying that's exactly what Zerubbabel's going to do. And so when Jesus comes back and he goes to the temple in the New Testament and he says, I'm going to tear down every stone. This is all going to be torn down and I am the rock you build on, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago. This is what he's talking about. And then it says, then the word of the Lord came to me. Zerubbabel's hands have laid the foundation of this house and his hands will complete it. Jesus Christ has laid the foundation for our faith. He has said, I will take you and I will make you. Same thing as this. And then he says, then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who scorns the day of small things? How dare you scorn the day of looking at something and thinking, oh, that's just a little thing. It's no big deal. Do you know how we get in problems with sin? It's because we say, oh, it's just a little thing. It's no big deal. You know, this morning, it always amazes me when I come to the Banneker. One of the things that has become a practice here at the Banneker Community Center is that people will sweep the entire floor of the gym. Thank you very much. I'm glad people do that. And then they will push it into that closet and put all of it in the floor of that closet without sweeping it up. I don't know who the first person to do that was, but somebody had the grand idea to do that. It, my guess is it, it was probably done in haste, right? I'm in a hurry. I, the games are starting. Just sweep it in there. I'll clean it up later. And then somebody else walks in because they leave and forget to clean it up, and then they see it laying there, and they're like, I'm not cleaning that up. Well, if I clean it up, then I'm going to re-sweep the gym, and I'm going to put it right back for the next person to have to clean up. And so now it's always a disaster in there, and I get to clean it up every week. I don't do that complaining. I do that as a reminder of that's God. God says the little things matter because it costs other people. Your sin costs other people. Your sin is costly to the people around you. It matters. Now, do we live in legalism? Do we strain out a gnat and swallow a camel, God says? No, we don't live in legalism. We live in love. And so when we sweep, we go, well, what would be the most loving thing to do? The most loving thing to do would be to sweep it up, put it in the trash can, then it goes out in the trash. Then I've taken care of it for the glory of God and for the serving of other people. Praise the Lord. But that's not what we do. We cut corners. And God says, don't scorn the little things. And see, what happened is, all the people came, they placed the capstone, grace, grace, and then they stopped working because it got hard. And that's what people do with the relationship with Jesus Christ. It seems exciting in the beginning. I'm going to bring Christ into my life. And then it gets hard. And we're like, oh, I'm just done. I'm just going to focus on my paneled house, just do what I can. Did you forget the grace what? The grace of God. You don't deserve anything and he's loved you and he's brought you back and he's rescued you from slavery and he's given you a purpose and a plan and he's given future generations a purpose and a plan through you. Wow! Goes on and he says this. Zechariah 12, 6, 12 says, you are to tell him, this is what the Lord of hosts says. Here is a man whose name is Branch. He will, be branch, he will branch out from this, his, his place and build the Lord's temple. That's Zerubbabel. But it's also Jesus. It's already, but not yet. God gives these pictures of already, but not fully yet. Here's what Jesus said in John 15. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. It's you and me. We're the Zerubbabels. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing Without me. You see, we think we can do some really cool things without God. God says, You can't do anything that'll last without me. You can build a temple. Listen, Herod built a temple for God's people, and it did nothing. It didn't change the people's hearts at all. And it says, If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and withers. 
They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. See, God says those of us who understand grace, those of us who trust him, will never be thrown into the fire. Because see, God can't turn his back on himself. And so when he implants the Holy Spirit in us, he can't leave us because it would be leaving him. That's the beauty of our Bible. That's the beauty of our God. He doesn't give up on us because he doesn't give up on himself. And he's bought us with a price and he's not selling us off. It goes on in Luke. See, because here's what happens. When you think of Jesus coming, and everybody likes to celebrate Jesus, Muslims, Hindus, everybody likes to talk about how great Jesus is. God wanted to be sure you knew exactly where Jesus came from because there are two lineages, one in the book of Luke in chapter 3 and another one in the book of Matthew chapter 1 that tells the lineage of where Jesus came from. One traces the lineage all the way back to Adam, the other one traces the lineage back to Abraham. And in Luke 3, he says, and he began his ministry. That's Jesus. He was about 30 years old. So we don't know much about Jesus' life from age 12 to 30. We know nothing. Except that he was doing what? Simple things. Obeying his parents, going to work, going to synagogue, loving the Lord. The guy with the biggest plan in the world was not too concerned about what he would major in. Wasn't too concerned about his master's or his doctorate. He was just being a faithful son to serve. Does that mean we shouldn't think about those things? We should. We should think about our ways. Just talked about that. But Jesus was so concerned about God's way, he wasn't concerned about his own. And at age 30, that's when you could start prophetic or priestly ministry. Jesus began his ministry to complete the Old Testament law. And he says, he was thought to be the son of Joseph. He wasn't the son of Joseph. He was adopted by Joseph. Just like God adopts you. You weren't born one of God's children. You were born a child of Adam in sin, but God says, I'll adopt you. I'll take you, and I'll make you my child. And that's what Joseph did. And so Jesus was considered a son of Joseph by adoption because he was born of the Holy Spirit. And then it said, son of Helel. Look at verse 27. Son of Jonan, son of Resha, son of who? Zerubbabel. God makes sure to mention Zerubbabel in both of the lineages of Jesus for us to read, to reflect back over his faithfulness. His grandfather isn't listed. Son of Neri. Matthew 1, 2 says, Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered, oop, I'm way behind, sorry. Let me catch up. I hate it when I do that. Oh, back. It says, Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Sarah by Tamar. Solomon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse and Jesse fathered King David. Do you see a problem in this lineage? I see a lot of problems. I see a big, huge, disastrous mess. Isaac fathered Jacob. Remember Jacob, the liar, the cheat, who stole the birthright of his brother? Boy, that's a good family. Yeah, that's the family God wants to partner with. woo And yet God takes Jacob in his brokenness and in his surrender, and he makes him into a great nation. And then you look on, and it says Judah. Oh, yeah, Judah, who, who uh, fathered Perez by um, raping or actually sleeping with his own daughter-in-law because he thought she was a prostitute. Boy, that's a great story. Glad that one's in the Bible for us to remember Judah by. Don't you? Would you love to have a story about you like that for everybody to read? Because that's what God does. God just says the truth. I will take Judah and I will remake him because Jesus is from the lion of the tribe of Judah. Solomon, fathered by Boaz, by Rahab. Rahab, the prostitute who was not even an Israelite but was a Jerichoite, like her? And then he goes on and he says, fathered Obed by Ruth. Remember Ruth who was a Moabite? Ooh, you know who the Moabites were, right? The Moabites were the people that were a people that came from Lot's daughters sleeping with him, their father. That's who the Moabites were. And Ruth was a Moabite who converted to Judaism, who converted to the Israelite and said, I, I want to follow Naomi. I want to serve Naomi. I, your God will be my God. And God says, I'll take that and remake it. 
Obed and Jesse. And then he fathered King David. It goes on and it says, David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. Oops, that's put in there. God wanted to know everybody where Solomon came from. David isn't going to lie about where Solomon came from. Solomon came from the guy he killed to have his wife. I mean, he goes on and he says, Solomon fathered Rehoboam, and Rehoboam fathered Abijah, and Abijah fathered Asa. These are horrible kings. If you look at like the process of kings, it's like, eh. The, the kingdom is split apart by Solomon's two sons. It says Hezekiah fathered Manasseh. Manasseh was a horrible king. Amnon was a horrible king. And then it says Amnon fathered Josiah. Josiah was a good king. He's eight years old when he became king. He brought a revival to the nation because he wanted a bedtime story, pretty much. He said, bring the Bible out, let's read it. And then he read it, and he's like, we need to do that. <laughs> then after the exile to Babylon, Jeconah fathered Shelatel, and Shelatel fathered who? There he is again, Zerubbabel. And Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Guys, God wants us to be certain that he has a plan, that he wants to take us and he wants to make us. And it's a simple process. He's not trying to make us the next president. He's not trying to make us some big, huge thing. Zerubbabel was no one to the powers of his day. He was a nobody. They they were still kind of like vassal servant slaves that they let return back to their land and build their little temple. You have a nice time over there. Persia was a mighty empire. I mean, you look at this and it's like God's just saying, I just want faithful people. I want people that will let me take them and make them into who I want. That's, that's the story. And it's a long process and we mess up and we do really stupid things like murder people, have sex with who we shouldn't have sex. We lie, we cheat. And God says, it's okay, I still love you. If you'll let me forgive you, if, you, if you'll let me pay the price, if you'll admit your sin, I'm with you. There's not another God like that in all the other religions. He doesn't say if you do enough sacrifices, if you pay me off this much, if you do. No, he's like, if you trust me, if you'll give your life to me. This is what Ephesians says about us. This is what Ephesians says about when God will take you and remake you. This is the picture God gives. And it is a beautiful picture that Paul lets us have to this Ephesian church. I'm just going to read through it. Here we go. Verse 3. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Messiah who is Yahweh who saves, who is the Messiah. Who has blessed us in the Messiah, or Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. For he chose in him, chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. He predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favor and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, grace that he favored us with in the beloved we have redemption in him through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that's free gift that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding he made known to us we're nobodies we don't deserve it the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he planned in him for the administration of the days of fulfillment and in other words you're going to live your life the next person's going to live their life for me until the day I decide life's over and I start over And he says to bring everything together in the Messiah, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. We have also received an inheritance in him. Just like Zerubbabel, we read in Matthew and Luke that God said, you have an inheritance, my son's coming through you. And I'm fulfilling that inheritance because that's what I said before. This is what God is saying to us. Do we believe it? He goes on and he says, Predestined according to the purpose of the one who works out everything in agreement with the decision of his will. Did he work out a king? Did he work out a temple he didn't want? Sure did. Sure did. So that we, who had already put our hope in the Messiah, might bring praise to his glory, not our own. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were also sealed That's the signet ring. You were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. No one can break the seal. If you know Christ, you have been sealed and delivered. God says, you're mine. I have paid for you. No one can snatch you out of my hand, and I'm not selling you off. 
I'm jealous for you, God says. And then he says, he is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. He said, I've put a down payment on you. There is, I heard a sermon this week and the pastor said, I realized when I put earnest money down in my house what earnest money meant. I had to write them a check and give the people the check. And, and I'm like, what is, where's that money go? And they said, well, that's a guarantee that you're going to buy the house. And if you don't, they get to keep the check. He's like, well, I'm not letting them keep my check. I'm buying the house. That's God. God puts the down payment of the Holy Spirit and says, I'm going to bring it to fruition. Revelation, God gives us a picture of what this is going to be like one day. He says, then he showed me the river of living water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God, the authority of God, and of the Lamb down the middle of the broad street of the city. This is Jerusalem. It's the last book of the Bible. This is when the end times come and when God is making all things new, he brings his city from heaven, he reestablishes the heavens and the earth, and it says, a tree of life was on both sides of the river bearing kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. Remember, we're just branches to produce fruit. And God says, I'm gonna have a tree you can eat from forever. It's constantly producing fruit. And then he says, look at this. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Yes, I'm going to strike the nations. I'm going to rip them down and rip down the authority. But I am telling you, when I do that, those that will turn to me, those that will think about their ways, reflect back, that will turn to me, that won't see their life as nothing, but see their life as something God can do something with, those people, they're going to see my healing. And then he says, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his slaves will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. That's the seal. Like, you're mine. Right? Then he goes on, he says, night will no longer exist and people will not need a lamp, lamp light or sunlight because the God, the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. We're gonna reign with him. He's gonna give us his authority. He's put his seal on our foreheads. They are mine, listen to them. And we're gonna do everything he asks us to do and it's gonna be great for all of eternity because everybody's gonna do what God wants and we're all gonna be cheering it on. Be like, whoo, that's awesome. I've given this example before. It's like a football game where you're a defensive back and the other guy's a wide receiver. Your job is to guard him. In heaven, I hope there's football. Maybe there is football. I don't know. But anyway, if there is football, I think the game's gonna kind of go like this. We're all gonna be in a stadium. We're watching the game play. These people have been gifted to play football for all of eternity. What a job. And so that's what their job is in heaven, right? Defensive back goes down the field. Quarterback throws the pass. Receiver catches it. Defensive back does not stop the touchdown. Defensive back gets up and starts screaming and praising God, saying that was an awesome catch. God is so good, he gave you that strength. Look at what we're doing out here, this is so much fun. Next time down the field, defensive back knocks the ball down. Receiver pops up and says, look at what God did through you. Look at what he just stopped. That was incredible. Woo! And the whole stadium's roaring for who? God. Period. That's what this is gonna look like. Haggai wraps up. Again, I'm gonna read this. And he says, on that day, when the end of time comes, when your day comes, when the end of your life comes, this is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. I will take you. Now the question is, where is he going to put us when he takes us? God says, you're going to be taken. You don't get out of this life alive. You will die. The question is, where are you going to go? And who are you going to go with? And God says, you are either gonna fire, you're either going to follow the person you're following to the lake of fire, or you're going to follow me to the lake of water, the stream of water. It's your choice. And I'll make you. It's not you have to do it. It's just surrender to me. And he says, my servant. Do you want to be God's servant? Then it's just one stone at a time. It's one decision at a time. It's just simple. This is the Lord's declaration and I'll make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord. Man, if that doesn't fire you up, if that doesn't cause you to be like, oh, thank you, I needed to hear this today. I don't know what will, because I needed to hear this today. The question is, will we stay in our captivity or we allow God to deliver us, to make us who he wants us to be? Think about your ways right now. Does it seem like nothing Reflect back. Are there things God's asking you to turn from? Have you never turned to him? Then turn to him. 
Let him take you and remake you like he's going to do the world and the heavens. Let's see what only God can do. See, he's building a temple and we are his stones. We are his living stones, Peter says. And he wants to use you for his glory. His king has completed it. And his king offers us a seat at the table. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for this word. Lord, these last three verses are just so jammed packed with the story of the entire Bible. That God, you have given your glory to us. You've given us the opportunity to participate with you and to follow you, and we've rejected you, but you haven't left us there. You've provided a way. You've asked us to think carefully about our world, think carefully about the things around us. You've called us that as we do that, to think carefully by looking at your word, looking at your promises and who you are. You've asked us to reflect back and You've asked us to see where we've turned and we can take glory in the the fact that you've helped us turn our lives from the things that used to destroy us. And you try to help us to see that there are stories of people being delivered and so we can trust you to deliver us for the things that, that haven't been worked out yet. And Lord, if it seems like nothing, you tell us that's not true, that you can make something out of nothing and you can even take our stupidity like a king and a temple and turn it around to be used for your glory. Lord, I thank you that you tell us that you want to take us and you want to make us into who you want us to be. Father, would we, would we believe that? Would we be willing to take the ring like a marriage? Would we be willing to say, we are your bride. We give ourselves to you. We surrender to you. Would we be willing to say that and say, okay, Lord, make me who you want me to be. Lord, I pray that if someone here has never prayed that prayer, someone listening has never prayed that prayer, Lord, I pray they'd pray it today, that they would see that they aren't nothing in your eyes, that you offered your son for them. And for those of us who may be struggling with this truth right now, I pray we'd take it seriously. We'd look at Haggai's words and really surrender ourselves to you and recognize that it's work, that it's one stone at a time, and it's, it's difficult, but it's worth it. And to know that you say, just like we read in Ephesians, that we are yours, we've been bought with a price, and you're going to do it. We pray in your name.